Andy. Thank you, team, for, uh, for leading us in those songs. And the, uh, the time we just shared in singing that last song and that um, little pause with instrumental just made me realise one of the things I'm going to mention um, early on in the message is something uh, I haven't really confessed to God, that is, uh, for about 40 years. And it just reminded me that I needed to do that. So thank you, team, for leading that. And thank you, God, for prompting my uh, hard heart. Uh, today, today we finish off our series, uh, you know what, the gates of hell. Well, you know, that's what, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And we've seen, uh, you know, we've looked at the first, or looking at the first eight chapters of the book of Acts up until uh, Paul's conversion or Saul's conversion. And just to see uh, the early church and, and what it went through. And we've seen how um, the promise of the coming Messiah happened. And then there was the promise of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. And, and that happened. And then we see like this expansion of the church from that day of Pentecost onwards. But we've also seen that there has been... Uh, opposition to the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we saw there was opposition against uh, the leaders uh, you know particularly um, uh, Peter and John uh, against a couple of the leaders of the early church we see there was opposition from within the church in the in the sense of sin from within and then we also saw that there was um, um, opposition from without and then we saw last week of uh, the scattering of the people of God uh, after the stoning of Stephen were really only the apostles were left in Jerusalem and everybody else was uh, sent further afield. And so we see that there was this spreading of the gospel and so fulfilment not just of uh, Jesus' great commission but also Jesus' repeat of the great commission there in Acts 1, uh, Acts 1 verse 8 where he said, you know, you go to all the world. And so here we see um, um, the spreading of the gospel to all the world. And we, and we read the story a little bit earlier of, um, of Philip, and we read the story of uh, the Ethiopian. Um, we all love to belong. I was reading something during the week where uh, it's like uh, what faith brings is a sense of community, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. But whatever group community we're involved with, we, we hunger and desire to belong. And I reflected back on my school days, and you know who were the you know who were the ones who really felt as though they belonged. I think it was like if you were really outgoing, charismatic type personality, people seemed to flock to you, and you had the school at your feet, or at least the students anyway at your feet, or. If, if that wasn't quite you, but you excelled in something really that other people admired, then you had a sense of, of great belonging. And for the rest of us, it was like, you know, there's a sense of insecurity, there's a sense of not quite belonging. But most of us probably had a few friends at school and, and did all right. I, I reflected on my year 11, we called it Form 5, back in my day, in year 11. And in year 11, I think um, there were lots of new people at the school at the start of the year because the local Catholic school only went to year 10 and so all the, all the Catholic school kids came to our public school in year 11. Um, but then a bit later on in the year, I'm not sure when, halfway, quarter of the way through the year, 
two girls turned up. Two girls turned up to commence at our school. They both seemed to turn up at exactly the same time, although one came from Victoria and the other one came from I have no idea where. Um, and these two girls, um, I have to say it right, they were rejected by us, by me, and by pretty well everyone in year 11. They found solace in each other, but they found rejection from the rest of us. Why? Not exactly sure why. They weren't the prettiest girls in the school, but, you know, I don't know. I'm not quite sure why. Don't know. And we had a, a terrible name for these two girls, which I won't repeat. But, but I was complicit in that. And, you know, we have these things today like the fear of missing out. Well, I think we also have the fear of rejection and, and, the, and the desire to belong and the desire to be accepted. In this story, we have um, Philip who was, um, you know, a bit of an evangelist and he was there in S Samaria and um, doing his thing, as it were, and, and being part of what, what seemed like a, a revival that was happening in, in that area. And then the Spirit of God told him to, uh, to go down to the road that went from what, Jerusalem down to, to Gaza. And the Gaza in those days was a, you know, an, an area. Like we had the Gaza Strip, and it was even on the news this morning, the Gaza Strip, and that's uh, pretty much the same sort of area. And there was a couple of roads down to there, but uh, Philip was meant to go, or meant to go down to one of these roads. And as he was on that road, of course, he, there was a man who was this man. We are not told his name. We are told this man was um, from Ethiopia. Um, so it was highly likely that he was uh, a black-skinned uh, African. And the Ethiopia in those days was a bit different to where Ethiopia is, as I understand it today. I mean, Adira will correct me, you know. Um, but I think it was encompassed maybe part of modern Ethiopia, but it was like on the southern end of, uh, of Egypt, down the, that part of the Nile. Uh, but this man was um, from Ethiopia, um, um, and he was like in charge of the treasury of the nation. Well, at least it seems like the treasury of... Um, the Candace is, is another translation of that word. It's where we get the name Candace. Candace is the, the name for the Queen Mother. You know, it wasn't, he was like, he was in charge of all that the Queen Mother was responsible for. Like he had his hands on the cash to look after all that cash. But what we're also told about this gentleman, and we're in fact told seven times in this passage. You think God's trying to highlight something? We're told seven times in this passage um, that this, this gentleman was a eunuch. Um, so whether he was um, born like that, whether he was um, um, castrated later on because of the role that he was fulfilled, not quite sure, but we're told seven times uh, he was a eunuch. What we're also told about him, that he, would, he was just returning uh, from Jerusalem and the festivals there, and he went up to, to worship there. So it, was, it, was, it seemed like this gentleman, this, this uh, gentleman from Ethiopia, was Jewish. Now, either Jewish by, you might say, conversion, or... The scholars think, it's probably think, the scholars think more likely Jewish by um, um, heritage, where there was the Babylonians came to Jerusalem 500 years earlier and scattered everybody, took some like Daniel, off to uh, Babylon and others were scattered all over the place, including down that part of the world. So 
maybe he was Jewish by you know ancestor, and uh, but he he went to Jerusalem for one of the festivals to worship God, and he was on his way home. On his way home, um, he was reading the book of Isaiah. And he was in his, let's say, gold chariot, his important man, gold chariot. And, um, and Philip comes up to this chariot, runs up to the chariot, whether he, the chariot was uh, racing along and it was a miraculous running beside it, not sure, or whether he had so long to go that he was just walking along on the chariot. And so Philip caught up to it, whatever. He caught up to the, the chariot and... Um, it was common in those days when you read the scriptures, maybe it was an attention thing, you read them aloud. It's like, you know what it's like, you can, you can read the Bible, three pages later you have no idea what you read. If you want to keep your attention a bit better, you stand up in a chariot and read aloud. Like, that'll keep your attention, surely. Or at least read it aloud if you haven't got a chariot to, to go by, okay? So, and if you want to stand up, that's okay too. So we have this gentleman who was uh, reading aloud um, in his chariot and he was reading part of the scriptures and, um, and, and Philip comes up and said, do you understand what you're reading? Like, great introduction. He says, how can I unless somebody tells me? And, and uh, probably thought, where have you come from? But anyway calls him aboard and they start to chat. Well, when I say chat, we see the Philip share with him from this passage and then beyond that passage, the scriptures, the gospel. I suspect, and again, uh, you know, I suspect when he started at that passage, we see it was Isaiah 53. And what's quoted there in the book of Acts was from verse 7 and 8. But listen to the, the immediately preceding verses. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us had turned on our own, uh, to our own way and the Lord has weighed on him the iniquity of us all. We see uh, like that immediately preceding part of, of what the eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch was reading. Like he was someone who was rejected, someone who didn't belong and, and, and Naturally, the Ethiopian chap says, well, was he talk is Isaiah talking about himself? Someone else. Well, opening for Philip to share the love of Jesus and that this was talking about Jesus. To share the gospel that this one who, who was seen and rejected by mankind, who, one who didn't belong was in fact the Messiah that they'd all been watching for and hoping for and waiting for and praying for for so long. This eunuch, however, um, he was one who was, um, had been to Jerusalem to worship. And it's fairly commonly understood that even though he was Jewish, he would not have been allowed into the temple because he didn't belong. Because he was a eunuch.
I don't know, but I suspect Philip flipped the page, well, or whatever they had, the scroll, turned down the scroll a little bit more to a couple of chapters later on in Isaiah where he read, in from, instead of from chapter 53, he might have read these words to the eunuch who didn't belong. Imagine, imagine the feeling of the eunuch. Like you, you come to Jerusalem to worship God. You come to the temple and you're not allowed in. Imagine what it would be like to turn up at church and say, you don't belong. You stay in the foyer or outside. You're not accepted. You're rejected. You don't belong. Difficult, I suspect, for us to imagine. But that's a physical not belonging. Sometimes we can feel as though we don't belong in other ways, of course. So I suspect uh, Philip, under the guidance of the Spirit of God, uh, went down the scroll a little bit more and from a couple of chapters later in Isaiah, chapter 56, read these words. And this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. Don't know, but I think that would be an appropriate place for Philip to scroll down to and uh, then continue on to share of, of the acceptance of him who was rejected in Jerusalem but was acceptable to God. Where there was a special place and a special honouring for him. And likewise we see in the next couple of verses of Isaiah 56 where there was a special place and a special honouring for those people who were regarded as aliens or foreigners. Um, we see that here uh, in the Gospel. And so Philip would have shared perhaps these things, but he certainly shared about Christ and his suffering on the cross. And the grace is this thing that saves us through faith, through Christ. Not through our works, not through our race, not through our culture, not through anything else. But he would have shared the things of the gospel. And, and that this one in Isaiah 53 who was talking about was not Isaiah, but was Jesus. That promised Messiah, the gospel the one who came to bring the good news, the one who was the good news. This was Jesus, the suffering servant, the one who was rejected, the one who was despised, but the one who came to embrace and the one who came to uh, ensure that people belonged and were adopted into the family of God, no matter what their circumstances, past or present. The Ethiopian chap was clearly, if I use the word impressed, totally inadequate. Not merely impressed, but the Ethiopian guy was convicted of not just his need for a saviour, but the, that the saviour uh, embraced him as he embraced his saviour. And so he responds and he says, mm, um, 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 here's some water, what's stopping me being baptised? So clearly, uh, I suspect, part of the presentation of the Gospel of Philip was to was to talk about uh, the grace of God, to talk about the cross of Calvary, and to talk about the baptism, which was the uh, visible sign of, of a person coming to belong to Jesus. And so we see... Oh, I'm supposed to have turned over a few slides. Forget it. So we see... Um, 
so we see as part of that it was a response where this uh, Ethiopian had now given his life to Jesus, felt Jesus' love and his embrace and his acceptance where he had been rejected by others. He's been accepted by God. And, and as part of that, he responded and said, I want, to, I want to follow him and I want to follow him through the waters of baptism. Here's a bit of water. What's stopping me? And... Um, You know, verse 38, I think it is there, or 37, 38. Lucky you will find down the bottom of the page on on many Bibles. um, You know, it just says if you believe in Christ as the Son of God, you can be baptised. That's that's okay. Um, Probably, why is it down the bottom? Probably not in the original, but a great verse to add just to help clarify a couple of things many might think. But, you know, probably not in the original. So if you say, well, you know, people are taking away from the Bible, well, more correct is probably people have added to the Bible. But anyway, that's another whole issue, I'm sure. But, uh, but and so he was, he was baptised. And uh, they were in, down into the water and up out of the water. And then uh, Philip disappeared and the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Never to see Philip again. What do we learn from this beautiful account? I think we learn a couple of things. I won't worry about the sides. Don't be too hard to find them now. We learn a couple of things. Um, We learn that there is acceptance by God and that acceptance cuts across racial barriers or racial lines. You know, this gentleman, he'd been to uh, Jerusalem and had been not, not allowed. He'd been rejected in terms of entering the temple. But we see... In, in the, the book of Acts, we see in the whole New Testament, but we see in the book of Acts as we look at the early church and we see the expansion of the early church, we see that expansion is fulfilling the great commission of Jesus. We see that expansion goes beyond um, just the local community there in Jerusalem and as we saw last week, I think it was, where, where um, you know, they were scattered at the stoning of Stephen. All the other... Christians, apart from the apostles, were scattered, like, go home, go home, go home. And we see now the, the gospel going across these racial lines. Um, certainly this gentleman was of Jewish race um, or faith, but we see it going across the, the racial divide. The gospel is for everybody. Many years ago, we had the privilege of going to Jerusalem and we had, um, we had a um, guide. Uh, I can't remember his name now. Kathy might. I can't remember his name. But we had this guide who was a lovely guy and we suspect may have been Christian, may. But it was interesting, you know, what he said was, like as a Jewish, like as Christians, you know, you want to take over the world. The Muslims, they want to take over the world. The Jewish people, they're not there to convert people to Judaism at all. They're happy with their Judaism and it's not for others, it's for them. Well, the gospel is not. It's for all. It's for all people across across all races, across all generations. It's for all. You know, we might, um, we might look back on our history and see some um, errors that, uh, that us or, or our church more broadly have made in terms of um, the cultural divide. 
where there has been um, uh, systemic uh, racism. That's not of God. Not of God. You know, we might need laws in Australia so that we don't discriminate. Um, the church shouldn't need such laws because the gospel is for all people, for all races. And, and so uh, I think we learn from, from this passage when the church is expanding and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, it, it will expand and needs to expand across all races. Uh, the other thing that we learn is that it's not just acceptance across all races, but it's acceptance cross-culturally. Uh, you know, across the cultural divide. Um, you know, we see here, again, this, uh, this eunuch was part of a, a group that, um, you know, was in, certainly in the minority and certainly one of the groups that the people, the Jewish people of God, uh, wouldn't allow to enter the kingdom, uh, the kingdom, the temple, because he was seen as unclean. We had these two girls in year 11 at school who we rejected because they were different. Can't even remember what way they were different. The kingdom of God is, is cross-cultural as well. Like I think cross-cultural, it's not the same necessarily as, um, as a cross-racial divide. Because like this, this man was uh, Jewish and yet was still not accepted. Like we have many, you might say, subcultures in Australia. And the gospel is... For all. The gospel is for all. You know, we're not here to make people more like us. We're here so that we all might be more like Jesus. We're not here to, to have that culture become like our culture or whatever. We're not here to make people more like us. We're here to make people more like Jesus. And so when we, uh, when we see the, uh, the super rich or we see the poor or the homeless, when we see the, the addicts, when we see um, those who are part of the culture of LGBTI community, where we see people of various subcultures within our society, they are loved by God and Jesus died on the cross for them. And we're not here to make them more like us. Our mission, the mission that Jesus has given, them, given us is to make us more like Jesus. And so that other people, we might see more people more like Jesus. Not more like us, but more like Jesus. And so people will come and we come. Maybe with, uh, and people will come maybe with broken hearts because of their insecurities or because of their, uh, their impurities of life. They might come with their broken hearts, but they also might come, some might come with their swollen heads like, for me to come to Jesus, I've mentioned a few times maybe so many years ago, wasn't because I don't think of a, like a broken heart, it was because my swollen head need to get corrected, punctured. Because in my swollen head I thought, culturally I'm a Christian because I'm white, Anglo-Saxon, middle class, living in Australia, by definition that's Christian. What a load of trash. Culturally, the gospel is for all. You know, um, uh, you know, a decade ago, I went to the Philippines a couple of times. 
and uh, you know we went to a couple of different places. One place we went to was way off in the Never Never, on on the coast, which is was just had a little road that opened up to four wheel drive and whatever. But it was like isolated as isolated. We went there because a family from our church down south came from that village. And talk about standing out. Like I and a couple of others, you know, we went and we stood out. Racially, yes, we stood out. Culturally, yes, we stood out. But you know, there was there was acceptance and there was a belonging. And and whilst there was some difference in part of it, but because of the acceptance and belonging, I was given the honour, given the honour of preaching in the local Catholic church in that village. Something I've never done before and I don't think I've ever done since either. But it's like they embraced us because we were part of God's family. Racially, way different. Culturally, Way, way different. And likewise, when we went down south to uh, a city called Palompon, um, you know, it's a city, I can't remember now, size of Gladstone, maybe bigger, can't quite remember, sorry, but lots and lots of people, lots and lots of, um, uh, you know, bikes and put-puts, as they call them, um, lots and lots of them, lots and lots of them, and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, and we stood out because this wasn't a touristy place, this was a bit like that village which is isolated, this wasn't isolated, but it wasn't a touristy place. It was a place, a Filipino city, and we stood out. But we were embraced because we were part of the family of God. The family of God. Didn't matter about race, didn't matter about culture, what mattered was Jesus. 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 And so when we think of our big heads or broken hearts, when we think of our insecurities or our impurities, it's like it's by grace we have been saved. Not because of our culture, not because of our race, not because of our good works but it is by grace we have been saved through faith in Jesus. That's the message of the early church. That's the message of the New Testament. That's the message of Gladstone Baptist Church. Where it's Jesus Jesus, Jesus, let's pray.